Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the death of Martha Mansfield. Was it an accident? Was it suicide? Or was it murder? No one really knows. But by the end of the video, you can decide what you think happened. Martha was born in New York City to Maurice and Harriet Gibson Elrich. She had a younger sister, Edith, born in 1905. Although many biographies state that she was born in Mansfield, Ohio, her birth record and death certificate both have New York City as her place of birth. Her mother, Harriet, was from Mansfield, Ohio, having immigrated there from Ireland in 1885. Martha later adopted the name of the town as her stage name. By the early 1910s, Mansfield and her mother had moved to the Bronx and were living on 158th Street. At the age of 14, she became determined to become an actress. She lobbied for and won a role in the Broadway production of Little Women in 1912. She also began working as an artist, model, and dancer. She danced in the musical Hop, Oh My Thumb in 1913, still using her birth name. She also acted in The Passing Show, 1915, and Robinson Crusoe Jr., before changing her name. As a model, she posed for illustrator Harrison Fisher and was the subject of more than 300 photographs by Alfred Cheney Johnston. Using the name Martha Early, she was signed to a six-month contract with SNA Studios in 1917, where she appeared in three films with French actor Max Linder in 1918, she appeared in the Ziegfeld Follies. Later that same year, she made her feature film debut in Broadway Bill, opposite Harold Lockwood. In early 1919, Mansfield announced that she had decided to pursue a film career full-time. Before she relocated to the West Coast, Mansfield played leads in films produced by famous players Lasky. In October 1919, she appeared in Florence Ziegfeld's The Midnight Frolic. Her first Hollywood movie was Civilian Clothes in 1920, directed by Hugh Ford. She gained prominence as Millicent Carew in the film adaptation of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. She then signed with Zanek Pictures, where she was cast with Eugene O'Brien in The Perfect Lover in 1919. In 1921, Mansfield returned to the stage in a vaudeville tour. She appeared in two independent films the following year. Queen of the Mullen Rouge, and Till We Meet Again. She spent the remainder of the year touring the vaudeville circuit. In 1923, Mansfield completed her contract for Selznick and signed with Fox Film Corporation. Her first film for Fox was The Silent Command, starring Edmund Lowe and Bella Lugosi. The final completed features in her short film career were Potash and Perlmutter and The Leamingtonworth Case. In 1923, Mansfield was given the lead in the Civil War-era silent film known as The Warrens of Virginia. There were hopes that the big-budget movie would propel Mansfield into the next level of Hollywood stars. The film told the story of a Southern woman who falls in love with a Union soldier during the Civil War. The film was shot in San Antonio, Texas, with Bracken Ridge Park being used as the battlefield at Adamo Metox. On November 29th, 1923. While working on location in San Antonio, Mansfield had just finished her scenes and retired to a car when a tossed match ignited her Civil War costume of hoop skirts and flimsy ruffles. Her neck and face were saved when leading man Wilfred Littell threw his heavy coat over her. The chauffeur of Mansfield's car was burned badly on his hands while he was trying to remove the burning clothing. The fire was put out, but she sustained substantial burns to her body. She was rushed to a hospital where she died the following day of burns of all extremities, general toxemia, and suppression of urine. Mansfield was 23 years old. Accompanied by actor Philip Shorey, Mansfield's body was transported back to her home in New York City. She was interred at the Woodland Cemetery in the Bronx. What they do not know, and what probably will never be found out is how the flames were kindled that sent her screaming from her limousine, a flaming torch, and seared her flesh so terribly that within a few hours she was dead. Those last few minutes before the tragedy, those now sinister moments where she was resting in her luxurious car, are shrouded in a deep and apparently quite impenetrable mystery.
The San Antonio authorities have no better a solution to offer for the Grim Enigma than the broken-hearted mother whose grief was made harder to bear by the mysterious uncertainty as to just how death overtook her daughter with such appalling cruelty and suddenness. Even Martha Mansfield's chauffeur and fellow actors, the men and women who reached her side within seconds of her agonizing screams, are unable to explain with any certainty what started the flames that swept over her crinoline costume and wrapped her in a deadly embrace. Was it a match, a cigarette, or a spark from a pipe? And whose was responsible for the firing of the thin fabric she wore? Was it her own or another that held the cigarette or the match or whatever it was that started the blaze? Whether it was Martha Mansfield's own hand or that of someone else that sent her to death was a tragedy, only the result of carelessness or some daredevil prank, or was it brought about through deliberate design? In the case of a girl so young and charming, so sunny and dispositioned and successful, the thought of murder or suicide seems preposterous. Yet those grim possibilities have to be considered in a mystery where every other theory has almost as little reason to recommend it. Literally, she just, one minute she's fine, the next minute she's coming out of her car on fire. Like, how do you explain that? You don't. It's weird. Poor Martha Mansfield, her lovely face, about the only portion of her flesh left unscathed by the flames, lived until the next day. She was conscious for frequent long intervals, but as far as can be learned, she never failed to reveal how she lit on fire. If anyone else knew the truth, his or her lips were remained sealed. No Thanksgiving day ever dawned with less hint of tragedy in the air than that day. It was a balmy, sunshiny morning, and Miss Mansfield and her fellow actors were up early. For them, it was no holiday. They must acquire an appetite for their turkey by a long day of posing on a location in the outskirts of the city. The director thought it absolutely necessary to take advantage of the sunshine because they had been delayed by bad weather and also because it needed only a few more shots of the camera to complete the film. But the actors had no complaint to make at having work. Martha Mansfield breakfasted at the St. Anthony Hotel with a number of her particular friends in the company and they always will remember the merry affair she made of what proved to be her last meal. She had installed a radio in her room and was enthusiastic over the way it worked. That evening, she planned to entertain them at a radio party. Why, it's simply wonderful, she cried. Last night, I heard Chicago and Cincinnati. Tonight, I'm sure I'll be able to get Philadelphia and New York. Do you know, it seemed almost as good as seeing Mother to think that probably she was listening in on this just the same thing I was. That's so sad. After breakfast, they all set out in their cars for the further end of Breckenridge Park, about three miles from the hotel. This had been chosen for the climax of the film drama because it was the highest spot in the vicinity and also because it contained a picturesque group of rag picker shacks that would be do very well for servants' quarters of this southern plantation. As no change was required, she put on her quaint costume before she left the hotel. She looked anything but like a prospective victim of death in her snow-white frock fastened high at the throat with a brooch with a skirt dragging on the ground and billowing around her girlish figure in the fashion of the 1860s. Nobody could blame the pretty star for feeling unusually proud and happy over her many causes for Thanksgiving. This was her first big film. Everybody was sure it was going to prove a tremendous success. On the strength of its promise, she already had signed a contract for another feature picture. The cameraman quickly shot several important scenes in the story of the pretty daughter of Virginia who fell in love with the northern soldier. Then came a pause while the workmen began setting up the carefully arranged interior of the plantation home where the final scene was to be staged. This would take about a half hour or more, so Martha waved goodbye to the director and her fellow actors, lifting her long skirt around her trim ankles and scurrying across the grass to where her limousine sat along a long line of cars. Her chauffeur helped her inside, then walked away to watch the work of the erecting of erecting the set. As far as is positively known, he was the last person to speak with her before the accident. He was standing perhaps 25 yards away from the car, and nobody can be found who will admit having been any nearer than that from the time she stepped into the limousine until she came running from it, ablaze from head to foot. 
At least 10, perhaps 15 or more minutes passed. The replica of a Virginia homestead was nearly ready for the heroine and her lover to walk along its picturesque garden path and enter the colonial doorway. Suddenly, above the workmen's hammerings and shoutings, came a woman's piercing screams. Everybody looked in the direction from which they came and saw the ill-fated little motion picture beauty running from her limousine in a sheet of flames. Wilfred Littell, her leading man, was the first to reach her side. He threw a coat over her in time to save her lovely face from being scorched and scarred, but before his hands and others just as willing could smother the fire that fed so ravenously on her old-fashioned billowing draperies, it had inflicted what proved to be fatal burns on her body and legs. Those who accompanied the stricken girl on the swift ride to the hospital say they can never forget how brave she was. She insisted that she was not suffering terribly, and what seemed to worry her more than anything else was the fear that her exquisite beauty had been damaged beyond repair. Are you sure my face is not harmed? She kept asking over and over again. Won't my cheeks and neck be scarred forever? The hospital physicians found her condition serious, but at first they thought she had a chance of recovery. That night, however, she awoke from a long sleep delirious, and the next day at noon she died. Died without a word to explain what caused this tragedy. A party of automobilists had passed Martha Mansfield's car a few minutes before she was seen in flames, saying they saw through the plate glass windows the flash of a match. This led to the quite natural suspicion that, after an audacious morning of acting, she was soothing her nerves with a cigarette. But the dead girl's mother insists that she rarely smoked, that she had a profound distaste for cigarettes. Martha often told me, says Miss Mar Mansfield, that smoking made her very uncomfortable and that she really didn't care for it. In fact, she said she seldom used cigarettes except when they were called for in a picture, and even then they made her feel ill. Once in a while she smoked at a party, if all the other girls did. But I can never believe that she lighted a cigarette if she was, as they tell me, sitting quite alone in her car. If it was a match of a cigarette that set my poor darling's dress on fire, it was not one of her own lighting. Of that, I am positive. Nobody can recall the girl ever having had a serious enemy, even if she had been the victim of some bitter hatred. How could anybody have been so fiendish enough to choose this way of revenge? What man or woman would have tortured a girl like this in order to kill her or ruin her beauty forever? Only a maniac police think. And they find no evidence that any such person was in or near Breckenridge Park that morning. To the theory that the film star suddenly lost her reason and herself applied the funeral torch, there are the strongest objections. Few girls of 23 are as sane, as sensible, as thoroughly happy and contented as was Martha Mansfield. Her buoyant spirits and complete satisfaction with life and the success it was bringing her were as notable as her good looks and her talent for acting. If she was alone in the car, if she had not been smoking, if there is no proof of murder or suicide, then what was the cause of the flames? Even if she had been smoking, it is hard to believe that a spark from her match or cigarette could have started a blaze too furious to be smothered by her own hands. Cigarette smoking was common in rooms filled with flimsy clothed women and hung with the most flammable draperies. Yet, who can recall a life having been lost from this cause? No one. Sus. What makes the mystery all the deeper is the fact that the upholstery and the woodwork of the car in which the fire is supposed to have started showed not even the slightest of scorching. If a match or cigarette was the cause of the tragedy, it would seem more probable that the victim was not, as a chauffeur and others in the vicinity have testified, all alone in the car. Perhaps she was engrossed in earnest conversation or engaged in a good-natured scuffle with some friend. Under either of these conditions, it would be easier to understand how the flame could have gained fatal headway before she or her companion realized the danger. But if there was someone in the car with Martha just before she lit a flame, why did that man or woman not relieve the anxieties of her family and friends by stepping forward and explaining what happened? There would, be, there would seem to be no good reason for silence on the part of a sharer of the film star's last happy moments of life unless unless this person is crushed by a feeling of responsibility for the flames that hurried the little film beauty to her untimely grave or they did it on purpose when the warrens of virginia was finally released in late 1924 mansfield's role had been edited down and rosemary hill was promoted as the female lead Mansfield left an estate valued at $2,473. She bequeathed $22,000 in Liberty Bonds to her mother. 
She also left her mother two life insurance policies, both worth $25,000 each. To conclude, I have no idea. This is so dang sad. She was 23, this was her biggest movie, she had so many plans, she was excited about a radio and, and thinking about the fact that her mom was probably listening to it too. Like, she was so excited for this, and then it ends with her getting lit on fire. And if it was just a, like a match or a cigarette, she should have been able to put it out. Unless that fabric is that flammable, it should not have just like lit her aflame like she was a freaking torch from one little thing. I don't know what happened. I don't know if she was alone or if she was with someone because they don't know. There's no evidence that someone else was in the car, but that doesn't mean someone else wasn't in there. The weird thing is, is that the car is fine. There was no burn marks in there. If she was on fire in the car, you would have seen something, but there wasn't. It's so dang weird. A dress like that should not just light a flame from a match. If we're talking like you're next to a fireplace in the back of your dress lights, well, that's different. But no, they're saying that a match could have done this. A match would not have lit the entire dress on fire that fast. You would have been able to put it out before it happened. So how this dress turned into literally a ball of flames, I have no idea. Was it her own doing? I don't know. Her mom said she didn't smoke. So maybe she did smoke because she was so nervous. Or maybe someone was in the car with her and was smoking and lit her on fire. Or maybe it was the window was open and someone accidentally threw a match through it, which it sounds really stupid. Or this or that. I have no idea. Was it suicide? I don't think so. Was it murder? Possibly. Was it a freak accident? That's also a thing. But life is so goddamn unfair. She was 23 years old. She had so much ahead of her. She had so many plans. She was going to be an actress and she was going to be famous and she was pretty and beautiful and like all these other things. She had so many plans and life just decided to punch her in the face and kill her. And she never woke up and was cognitive enough to tell anyone what happened. She never got to say if it was her fault, if it was someone else's, if she was attacked. Like, no one knows. I hope one day we get some evidence as to what happened to her, but until then, I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I will be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday, and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys, I'll see you later.